this morning, let's create some context. Shortly before the cross, Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane. He was in such agony in the anticipation of what was before him that the Bible says drops of blood were literally coming from his brow. Surely it was more hideous than any of us could ever imagine. The Roman soldiers beat Jesus senseless after whipping him 39 times. And very likely his internal organs were exposed. They mocked him. They spit on him. The creation was abusing the Creator. They took a crown of thorns and they pushed it down on his head so hard that blood poured down his bruised face. He was beaten so much that the Bible says he didn't even look human. Then they took huge spikes and they drove them through his wrists and through his ankles into a wooden cross and then they suspended him in midair. So Jesus is hanging on that cross and the Bible says these words in John chapter 19 and we'll start reading at verse 28. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. It's interesting in the Old Testament that there are many prophecies about Jesus' life and this is one of them that he would be thirsty and that he would be given vinegar to drink. Let's keep reading. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. Imagine the moment when this prophecy is fulfilled. We don't know if it's a a triumphant cry or a private whisper to his father that Jesus says, it's done. We did it. It is finished. Father, everything you sent me to do is done. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. The words, It is finished in the Greek is translated tetelestai. And tetelestai means to end, to complete, to execute, or to discharge a debt. And there are a few contexts that this can be used in. It could be a servant returning to his master saying, I have finished the task. There is nothing left to be done. The work is complete. It could be also used... For a merchant declaring the debt is paid in full, the balance owing is zero, everything is totally paid. It could also be used when a priest approves a lamb for sacrifice. It is perfect. There are no blemishes at all. Jesus finished his assignment and changed history that day. He paid the debt in full. The sacrifice was perfect Nothing can be added. Jesus did everything his father sent him to do. Jesus said, the mission you sent me to do has been completed. It is finished. And this morning you may ask, well, what did he finish? So many things. For example, here are just a few of the Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled that day. And they were utterly literally uttered hundreds of years before this event. Amos said, darkness would befall the land. And it did. Isaiah said, Jesus would be rejected, and he was. That he would be beaten, and he was. That he would be spit upon, and he was. Isaiah also said that Jesus would pray for his persecutors, and he did. That he, would be persec- that he would be crucified by thieves, and he was. And the psalm says Jesus would cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he did that as well. So what else was finished? Satan's plan since the birth of Jesus had been thwarted, 
He was doing everything he could to sidetrack Jesus from that road to the cross, but he failed. Sin and death lost their sting that day for those who are in Christ. The sacrifice was perfect. The debt had been paid in full. Jesus finished well. That's the good news. But we have not finished. We have unfinished business. There is more that God wants to do in you and through you. Revelation chapter 3 says this in verses 1 and 2. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Shortly after Chris and I were married, we wanted to buy a new stereo for our home. And we were excited. We found what we wanted, but it was pretty expensive and we didn't have a lot of money to spend. But the salesperson, he, uh, he was a good salesperson and he said, no worries, you can take this home today and not make any payments for 12 months. And I think you know where I'm going with this story. So we bought the stereo that day. We took it home, and we enjoyed it, and sometimes our next-door neighbor would be playing his stereo so loud, and we would just turn up our stereo, and we we would have stereo wars. We were enjoying it. Fast forward 12 months later, and we get an outrageous bill in the mail. We didn't recognize the company that sent the bill, so we called them to find out what's going on. Who are you? Well, the bill was from a credit company who worked with the store that sold us the stereo system. And uh, we knew, okay, it's about time to start paying for our new stereo. And we didn't really forget to pay it. We were just enjoying our 12-month grace period. But why is this bill so high? There had to be a mistake. Well, what the salesperson didn't tell us was after the 12 months, all the interest that was accrued during those 12 months would be added on to the principal, and the bill was much higher than we had expected. And it was probably in the fine print, and he maybe even told us when he sold us this, but we were too excited. We were just, you know, we wanted to get it home and start enjoying it. We were devastated. If only we had known, we would probably have made some payments during those 12 months. And now we had a huge interest payment on top of the the normal cost of the stereo. So what was our unfinished business? We needed some financial guidance and some knowledge, someone to tell us how interest worked. Obviously, we didn't have a clue. What is your unfinished business today? And I want you to write that down. Identify your unfinished business. Maybe it's forgiving someone who has hurt you. Maybe it's trying to restore a relationship that is not healthy. Maybe it's finishing that college degree you started. Maybe it's taking better care of your body. Maybe it's dealing with sin in your life. Write the first thing down that comes to your mind. Listen to what God would say to you in light of what you just wrote down. Every day that we live is another opportunity to get closer to the purpose he has given us. And like Jesus, we need to finish strong. A lot of people start, but few finish. So how do we, like Jesus, finish well when so many times we start something and we don't finish it? How can we finish strong? I'm glad you asked this morning. You can write this down. We need to make a commitment Make a commitment. Our culture says, don't commit to anything. Keep your options open. Don't get tied down. I think many of us have a skewed view of what commitment actually is. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 11 says this, Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. Our society often stops at eager willingness. That's as far as we go. 
You may commit to losing weight, but if there are still cookies in your pantry, you really haven't committed to anything. Someone once said, a dream without a plan is just a wish. It isn't commitment until you change and complete what your eager willingness was all about in the first place. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus committed to follow through no matter what. And the Bible says the stress he was under was so great that the capillaries in his skin burst and he was sweating blood. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, he said. But he didn't stop there. He stepped across the line called commitment when he said, yet not my will, but yours be done. So we need to make the commitment. The second thing we need to do is take the next step. That's what Jesus did. And maybe you're looking at the big picture today, and sometimes when you do that, it's easy to get overwhelmed. Just take the next step. There's a little saying that we like to use here with our, our team at BCC and that goes like this. Make the next right decision. Don't worry about five or seven or ten decisions down the road. Just make the next right decision. It just starts with one step. And I'm thankful that God doesn't show us all the steps at once. He loves us too much to do that. He's too good a father to do that. He knows if he showed us his plan all at once, we couldn't handle it. So he just shows us the next step. And he says, trust me. Then take another step. And then another. We live one day at a time. And that takes faith. Galatians chapter 5 verse 25 says this. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Psalms 119 verse 105 says this, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It doesn't say it's a huge spotlight or a beacon. It says a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Just showing the next step. So what was the next step for Chris and I in our little conundrum with our interest payments, we had to meet with someone who could help us, give us some guidance with our financial situation, and we needed to make a plan to pay off that loan, and we did. So what's your next step? Write that down today. Maybe it's making a phone call to a person that you have to forgive. Maybe it's getting a mentor to help you get to the next level of what you're doing. Maybe it's updating your resume. Maybe, maybe it's having a tough conversation with someone. Maybe it's confessing your sin. Maybe your next step is surrendering your, surrendering your life to Christ today. In the 1968 Mexico City Olympics, a runner named John Stephen Aquari from Tanzania fell during the race. He cut his knee severely and he dislocated his joint. He injured his shoulder as well. And an hour after the winner crossed the finish line and most of the fans had left the stadium, John Stephen Aquari limped into the stadium. When he was interviewed afterwards, he, he was asked, why did you do that? Why did you keep going? Nobody would have blamed you for quitting after what happened to you. And I love how John Stephen Aquari responded. He said, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start a race, but to finish it. He didn't win a medal that day, far from it. But in defeat and in pain, he came to represent something much more profound and enduring. He finished his race. God did not put you on this earth to start a race and not finish it. He wants us to commit and then take that first step towards our goal. So how do we do this? The Apostle Paul wrote these words. 
However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race the Lord Jesus has given me. And here's his race. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. So this morning, let's make that commitment and take that first step. So one day we can stand before God and say, it is finished. I've completed the task you sent me to do. And he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, we acknowledge there is unfinished business in our lives. Holy Spirit, help us make a commitment and help us take that first step towards you today. Father, we thank you that your word is a light and a lamp to our path. We thank you, God, for giving us the strength and courage to make the commitment and take that first step. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe you're watching today and maybe you're not walking in God's purpose and plan for your life. I want to pray for you today. Maybe as I was talking, it became crystal clear that your first step was making that commitment. Today is your day. So I invite you to pray with me wherever you are. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for dying for us and for rising again. Today, we make you Lord of our lives. We commit our lives to you today, and we thank you for making us a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.